Bow your heads, please. Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for a mind to say yes this morning. Yes to your will, yes to your way. God, you know us. You made us. And God, you have prepared us for this journey that's called life. We ask, God, that you would just open our hearts up this morning, that we may receive your word. We've heard all of man's word all week long. But, God, we yield ourselves now to have instruction and direction from heaven. We want to hear from you, Lord. God, we ask that you would empower your servants, God, to move out of the way and to allow your word to have free course through them to us. And we ask it all believing that it's done in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. We thank the Lord so much for each one of you, and we thank God for the freedom to worship, to worship God. And to worship God is simply to give God his worth. Amen. I'm so grateful this morning that I'm in a place where man won't get in between me and God. Because if you're like me this morning, you need, you need to hear from God. Amen. Can't go, we can't make a move, Lady Deborah, without him. We're so grateful to be reunited with our spouse. Uh, I thought it was uh, going to be a wonderful idea to be without a wife and to not have to worry about any kind of uh, uh, reprimands or <laughs> instructions. P pick this up. Sit over here. Don't, don't you think maybe that we might, we got into it not long ago, but I told her, I said, you're just too helpful. He said, I'm just trying to help you. I said, well, you're just too helpful. Yeah, but we got over it. But hey, man, I, I, I found out that uh, there's a reason that you're married. There's a reason. Hey, Amen. And all of that goes in to make a wonderful life. So if I can help it, I ain't going to leave her no more because it just wasn't no fun. It just wasn't. <laughs> Once I get her down there, man, I might have second thought, oh, I should have left her there. But be as it may, this is my teacher, and I ask that uh, at this time that you would receive her with the words of amen as she comes to uh, teach the word. God bless you. I appreciate you so much. God bless you. Good morning, everybody. Amen. It's so good to be here today and so good to see each one of you. I'm just... Uh, uh, praising God for another day. The saints said, this is just another day that the Lord has kept me. And I can truly testify to that because I realized at some point, I realized that I wasn't keeping myself. And so I thank God for his keeping power. Amen. Amen. He's able this morning and we're just appreciative of him for all that he continues to do and just how he's working mightily in our lives. He's a good God. You know that. He's just good anyway, in spite of us, in spite of all that we do and how we mess it up and how we just, uh, well, because we can do a really good job at messing it up, but he continues to be a good God, and I just give him glory for that, and I give him praise for that. So good to see each one of you, and I echo the sentiments of my husband. It's just good to have him back home, although I, I um, you know, just... It's just good to have him back home. So I just praise God uh, that he's back. Amen. We are in the uh, study of Genesis, the patriarchal stage. I'm going to see if this is working today. It is working today. And um, I, I uh, have just a trivia question. I don't have a prize for you, but I just want to know who was listening Sunday. Uh, who was here for the service, Sunday service? Who was here for a pastor's sermon? Okay, Pastor Sermon came from Second Chronicles, the 20th chapter. You remember that? And in Second Chronicles, the 20th chapter, he talked about how uh, Jehoshaphat was met with the children of Moab and the Ammonites, the Moabites and the Ammonites. Without looking at your Bible, I want you to tell me, where did the Moabites and the Ammonites originate from? From who? From a lot. From a lot. From a lot. Where can we find that in the Bible? We, we're, that we studied it last Sunday, and that's why I'm asking you. I wanted to see if you connected the two of those. It's in Genesis. It is in Genesis. So go ahead and look at your Bibles, and let's find it. It's Genesis what? It's Genesis 19. Genesis 19. 
Very good. That's very good. Let's give everybody a hand for that. Genesis 19. So that is when we talked last Sunday, we said that remember how the daughters of Lot went into him and he didn't even realize that they had gone into him and they both became pregnant. And when uh, they got pregnant, they had Moab and Ben-Ami, which became uh, the, the fathers to the children of uh, the Moabites and the Ammonites. So that's just a connection there, and that's just how we connect the dots when we uh, hear something. And that's why we study. Uh, we get the background in Genesis so that when we go forward, we have an understanding of where things originated, which Genesis is the book of beginning. So let's go to Genesis, and let's go to... Uh, Genesis, the 21st chapter. We are just doing a slow roll here, and it's been a good study. And so as we are entering into Genesis, the 21st chapter, and so now we are, we, we, we are looking at Sarah, we're looking at Abraham, and we're looking at them while they are waiting on the promise of God. Now, I heard someone say this, and I believe that it is the honest truth. When I heard it, I said, you know what? That's the truth. And what they said was that receiving a promise is easy, but waiting on the fulfillment of that promise is a mission. You believe that? Amen, because I've had things, that I, I'll just go back to your pastor, y'all. Y'all know he got that Apple Watch for Father's Day. Well, initially, he didn't want the watch. But when he was told that the watch was on the way, every other day, he's, when is my watch coming? When is my watch coming? He got the promise, and that was easy, but now he had to wait on the watch. I was like, well, honey, you got to wait. It's coming. I got, the, I got the notification saying it's coming, but you have to wait. So it's a mission in waiting. I don't care what it is. And so we find Abraham and Sarah in the mission of waiting. So much so that Sarah tried to help God out herself and found out the hard way that God didn't need her help. And I, again, I submit to you this morning that God doesn't need our help. Whatever he has said he's going to do, don't you know God is God? That's what makes him God that he can perform whatever he said. He's a God who can make something out of nothing. Surely, if he promised you something, he's a God that can fulfill it. The thing is the timing, the timing. And we, are under, we understand that his timing and our timing are so different. It's just so different, and that's what causes the problem. Well, there's evidence that you're walking by faith because that's what happens. When you're in the waiting stage, you, you have to walk by faith. You're not walking by sight. And so evidence that you're walking by faith is that you have a willingness to wait, a willingness to wait, rather than you stepping up, trying to do it on your own and messing everything up, then you're just waiting on God. Also evidence that you're walking by faith is that you're concerned only for the glory of God. See, when Sarah got in there and started working with it and, and working with it, God couldn't get the glory. And the reason that God couldn't get the glory with that was because she was doing it out of her flesh. And anything, anything that you're doing in your flesh, it, God's not going to get the glory for that. You're trying to bring the glory to yourself. Because, see, Abraham at that time was still able to get a child. It was still, he was, it was still uh, possible for him to uh, inseminate uh, Hagar. And so you couldn't say that, oh, that's a miracle. That was a miracle. You couldn't say that God did that. No, uh, Abraham and Sarah did that. Abraham and Sarah did that. And so then uh, receiving the promise is easy, but waiting on the promise, waiting on the fulfillment of the promise is a mission. And so in chapter 21 then, we began with the spoken word of God, and the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, as he has said. I take great joy in knowing that. That gives me joy to know that just what he had said, that he follows up on it. Many times when we make promises, have you ever made a promise and you forgot someone came to you and said, uh, 
Don't, do you remember what you told me? And you, oh my goodness, I just totally forgot all about it. I got so much stuff going on that I forgot all about it. God's not like that. God's not like that. He doesn't forget what he say yet. And so in uh, chapter 21, verse 1, it says, And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. Because now, what's happened? Now the time has come, we read over in, in, in Hebrews, the time has come when their bodies, both their bodies, are as good as dead. As good as dead. Man would say there's no hope for any conception. Their bodies are as good as dead. So now the time is right for God to come in, uh, as Shirley Caesar would say, just right for a miracle. Just right for a miracle. And so uh, verse 2 says, For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. The set time, he mentioned the set time in Genesis the 17th chapter. Go there, Genesis 17 and 11. Genesis 17 and 11, uh, the Bible says, 17, I'm sorry, 17 and 21, 17 and 21. <clears throat> but, from, but my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. So tell the person sitting next to you that God has a set time. Tell somebody else God has a set time. God has a set time. Go to Galatians, the sixth chapter. Galatians, the sixth chapter and the ninth verse. And you can just hop in anytime you want to with a question or comment, an observation. Galatians 6 and 9. Paul talking to uh, uh, the church at uh, Galatia, and he says this, that let us not be weary in well-doing or in doing well, for in due season, in due season, at the time that's right, in your season. So God's set time is always the right time. It's always the right time. It's all for us because we're in the waiting stage. And remember, waiting for the fulfillment of a promise is a mission. So it seems all for us, and it seems like he's not coming, and it seems like he's taking too long, and it seems like during that time that we become overwhelmed and we become uh, dismayed and we become uh, anxious and uh, we become disappointed about it because he's just not coming when we think he should come. But God has a set time. And his set time is always the right time. His set time is always the right time. He does not make a mistake. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. If we faint not if we don't give up, if we don't try to do it on our own, we shall reap if we faint not. Go back to uh, Genesis, the 21st chapter. And so now Abraham is 100 years old and Sarah is 90 years old. So I ask you the question, is anything too hard for God? Nothing. There's nothing too hard for God. I tell you, I serve a... Uh, 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 a wonder a working God. He's a wonder working God. And you know, it's sometimes it's the things that we will call little things. To me, I tell you, when you can open your eyes in the morning, is that a little thing? We call that a little thing, but that's not a little thing. It's not a little thing. When you can get a breath in, because some people struggle to breathe, and ask them if that's a little thing. 
That's not a little thing. He's a wonder-working God. Then when you can, your mind tells your, your legs to move and your hands to move, and you can throw yourself over the uh, edge of the bed, get up, and walk around. He's a wonder-working God. I tell you, there's nothing too hard for God. Uh, there's not even when you get a, a, a light bill that's over $50. And, and we struggle many times, and that's not a little thing. We struggle many times. There's nothing too hard for God, y'all. There's nothing too hard for God. And so um, it's, it's all about the waiting stage, and it's all about walking by faith. And so we continue to trust him even through the times that we are waiting. So we're going back to Genesis, the 21st chapter. Are you there? And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. I'm in verse uh, 4. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God had commanded him. And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. And Sarah said, God has made me to laugh, so that all that hear will laugh with me. And she said, who would have said unto Abraham that Sarah would have given children suck? For I have borne him a son in his old age. Now, man would have said it, but God had already said it. Man wouldn't say it because man sees with a natural eye. Uh, but God had already said it. And the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. So now remember, though, that they are living with the consequences of their actions, as we have to do. Sometimes we want to sleep what we've done away, or we want to wish it away. We want to think, oh, my God, if I just hadn't done that, but you did it. But we did it. And so whatever we do, we have to live with the consequences of our actions, whether it's good or whether it's bad. So now what's the consequences of their previous action? Ishmael. Ishmael is in the house. So you got two children growing up in the house. Now Ishmael at this time is probably about what, 17 years old maybe? So Isaac is being weaned and he's probably about three. Uh, and so now you got Sarah with her baby, you got Hagar with her little teenager, but he's still uh, is causing trouble. He's gonna cause trouble. So your past comes back to haunt you. You know, we don't live in the past, but then you, you, you have a past. You, this, it's a reality that you have a past. Some of us, some of the things that we're suffering in our body is a direct result of the things that we did in the past, consequences of our past actions. And so um, Abraham and Sarah said, God hath made me to laugh. Okay, I've gone there. Verse 9, and Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had born unto Abraham, mocking, mocking. Now, you know, we don't, we don't like that. We don't like to be mocked. No one likes to be mocked. No one likes to be mocked. That's a fight right there. Wherefore, she said unto Abraham, cast out this bondwoman. It's just amazing to me how much better sense she has now. It's amazing to me that hindsight is 2020. She now she just got so much sense that now she sees that that the two of them can't live together. Well, because uh, uh, you know I don't know what she thought, but that we talked about this last Sunday is that if you produce a child, if there's any kind of anything in you, you're going to have some type of feeling for the child. You should. You should. That child is a part of you. No matter who you were with, that child is a part of you. And so Abraham loved that child just like he loved Isaac because uh, Ishmael was his son. Ishmael was his son. And so uh, she says, cast him out. Cast out this bondwoman, not just this bondwoman, but cast out this bondwoman and her son. For well, the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. 
And the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. It was very grievous. If you go back and look up the root word uh, grievous, it's going to tell you that it was, he was deeply moved. He was deeply moved. It, it, it troubled him because really, he didn't really want to let that part of him go. Hey, God could have gone on, really, but it was that part of him that he really didn't want to let go. So then we look at this as we look over in Galatians, the fourth chapter, where Paul talks about all of this as an allegory, where we began to look at Isaac as uh, what happens in the flesh, or, or Isaac, I'm sorry, what happens in the spirit, and then Ishmael, of uh, the flesh. So let's go to Galatians. Am I right there? Galatians, the fourth chapter, is that right? Mm -hmm. Galatians, the fourth chapter. Let's talk about um, Isaac as being symbolic of the spirit. Isaac being symbolic of the spirit. Why, why, why? Born of the spirit. Because by that time, by that time, as I've already said, his parents were both as good as dead. And only God's power could have resurrected them and brought forth that birth. Ishmael, born of the flesh, because Abraham had not yet died. We talked about that earlier. He was still able to beget a child. Now, now, now. Was born of the spirit is spirit. Was born of the flesh is flesh. The spirit, was born of the spirit, will bring joy. Was born of the spirit will bring joy. Uh, in Romans, the 14th chapter, uh, would someone find that for me? Romans 14 and 17 and read that. Romans 14 and 17. Okay, okay, so that's what you're going to get in the spirit. That's what you're going to get in the spirit. But in the flesh, you're going to have a constant source of trouble. Do you believe that? A source of painful trouble. In Galatians, the fifth chapter, the 16th and the 7th verse, Galatians 5, uh, the 16th and the 17th verse, it says, This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. And can you see how Ishmael represents the flesh? Can you see how Isaac represents the spirit. Can you see that just from what we've already read? Isaac. Isaac represents the spirit because he was born rich and he was born free. He was born rich and he was born free. But Ishmael, in representing the flesh, was born the son of a slave. He was born the son of a slave. The flesh, you, you, the flesh will hold you hostage and, and in bondage. And so uh, in Galatians, in Galatians the uh, fourth chapter, in Galatians the fourth chapter, Paul gives an allegory, allegory just a, a story that's symbolic of something. That's all that means is that he tells a story but when you read the story it actually has another meaning. And so he talks about Hagar, and he talks about Sarah. Now, we know that Sarah was wrong when she sent Hagar in to Abraham, but now she was right when she told him to send her away. And that might seem cruel, it might seem harsh, but we just read that uh, the spirit and uh, the flesh, they can't, they can't commingle, cohabitate. They can't cohabitate. They lust against uh, each other. 
And so um, Cheryl was wrong when she uh, told them to send her away. But she was right when she told Abraham to... Um, she was wrong when she sent her in to Abraham. But right when she told her to send her away. And so what's the lesson in this for us? The lesson is simply that there are, uh, as children of God, to live under the blessings of grace and not the bondage of law. Not the bondage of law. So let's go to Galatians, the fourth chapter, and let's look at the allegory of Hagar and Sarah. Are you there? In Galatians, the fourth chapter, and the 21st verse, the Bible says, Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law. Do you hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. But he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is, is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that beareth not, Break forth and cry, thou that travaileth not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath a husband. Now we brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then, he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit. You remember in the story in Genesis how at, during, when he was being weaned, how uh, Ishmael began to mock him. Even so, it is now. Even so, it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. We're not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. And so then he's going to go on then uh, and, and, and talk to them about, so then if you are uh, children of the free, then the results, what's the results of living as children of the free? Let's talk about Sarah and Hagar and look at that. Uh, as he has talked about it as an allegory. So Sarah really represents grace, and Hagar represents law. So when we look at grace, when we look at Sarah, when we look at God, God did not start with the law. Would you agree with that? If you go as far back as Adam and Eve, God didn't start with the law. Uh, no. He didn't. God, God was, uh, his relationship with Adam and Eve was a relationship based purely on grace. He gave them everything. He gave them everything. If you go back to when he redeemed the children out of uh, Egypt, that was based on grace. That was not based on the law. When you go back to his provisions all during that time, it was based on grace, even before the law was given. So God started out with the law, so with, with grace. I'm sorry. Thank you, baby. And when we look at Hagar as representing the law, she was Abraham's second wife. She came alongside the law, mm -hmm. something that was already established. So she came alongside the law. And so now grace doesn't serve law is the law that serves grace. So uh, Hagar, Hagar, as we've already said, she was a servant. She was a servant. Uh, but now we're talking about grace, and so when we're talking about grace, 
all of these blessings righteousness life the whole the, the life in the spirit righteousness in the spirit uh, the internal inheritance all of those come only by grace only they come only by grace that's our scripture the one we quote all the time in Ephesians the second chapter 8 through the ninth verse so Hagar when you think about it she was never supposed to have Abraham's child and so the law cannot give what Jesus Christ can give. And those are those things that we just talked about. The law can't give life. The law can't give righteousness. Uh, no, because it's not a faith. And so Hagar gave birth to a slave because the law produces bondage and not freedom. And so the freedom comes as a result of us being under grace. Then Paul says in Galatians, the fifth chapter, and the first verse then, because you are free, it starts in the 31st uh, verse of Galatians 4, it says, so then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. And then he says, so then, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith God hath made you free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. It's a yoke of bondage. And I tell you, when you are entangled with something, how many of you have ever had, I know many of women probably, you know, a ball of yarn or a, a thread or something that's gotten tangled up and you, a chain that you, a little bit of chain that you wear around your neck, it gets a knot in it and it's hard to get the knot out. When you're entangled in something, it's hard to get out of it. Oh, we've heard our pastor say many times, oh, oh it'll take you 15 years to get out of something that it only took you 15 minutes to do. I'm a living witness to that. I'm a living witness. I'm a living witness. It's the honest to God truth. And whenever I hear that, I say, oh, God, help me today. Help me today. And so be not entangled again mm -hmm. be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage and so then grace and the law hagar was cast out completely let's think about that for just a moment hagar was cast out completely and permanently it wasn't no you cast out and then go back and get her mm -hmm. now the first time she left and she ended up coming back right because god told her to go back mm -hmm. And then when she went back, she had to be under submission. She had to go back and just get it right on in your place. Right. Remember, you a bond woman. You a bond woman. So get back in your place, get under submission, and act like you know. Act like you know. And so she was sent back the first time, but the second time, when Sarah said, you cast her out and her son. Cast her out and her son. It was grievous to Abraham because he loved the child, but he realized this time it wasn't no coming back. Can't come back this time. Mm -hmm. Like, like my, my uh, friend in the church where I was, I don't know where you're going, but you got to get up out of here. You got to get out of here, and you can't come back. And so let's talk about this. You're sitting next to someone. Talk about this to the person you're sitting next to. What are the results? of compromising with the law. What are the results of compromising with the law? I'm going to give you some time to talk about that. Exactly. Christy? Okay, okay. Um, anything else? Anything else? Well, um, I love this. I love this story. I love the symbolism in this story. I love the, the one in Genesis, and I love the allegory that Paul gives to us in Galatians. And so we've already talked about how it grieved Abraham. Let's go back to Genesis, the 21st chapter. We have just a few more minutes, and I'm going to end here. And then the next Sunday, we're going to start out with uh, the test that Abraham had you know, he was in a continuous uh, school of faith, school of faith, continuous for him, because the next test that he's going to have will be where God commanded him to offer up his son Isaac, the child of the Spirit. 
the child of promise. I waited until I was 100 years old, like you told me to do. And so we're going to begin there. But um, he was deeply moved because the child was his. But uh, I want to get to this point, and we'll end here uh, because our time is spent. The point that I want to uh, get to is that um, because God is a God of his word, God is a God of his word, even though Hagar and Ishmael were cast out, God provided for them. Amen. God made provision for them because Ishmael was the seed of Abraham, and God had promised a blessing over the seed. And so when God says something, he doesn't go back on it. He doesn't go back on it. And so God made provision for them because his word had gone out and he honored his word. And this morning, I say to you as I end this part of our worship service today, that whatever God has said to you, whether it was five years ago, 15 years ago, and then you may be dead and gone on, but his word is coming to pass. Give the Lord a hand, praise everybody. Amen.